Coming up next on Tech News Today, Happy New Year. It's good to have you back. Tesla's enhanced autopilot system begins to roll out to some people. Also, the value of Bitcoin is near an all-time high. Near an all-time high. France says employees should put the phone down at dinner time, please. Uh, how to exercise while you're vr -ing. And a quick look at a few pre-Consumer Electronics Show announcements. All that and more with my friend Ron Richards on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1674, recorded Monday, January 2nd, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of SuperTank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT to receive a free Tracker Bravo with any purchase. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about some of the biggest tech news stories with people who are passionate about technology. I'm Jason Howell, returning from a break that was long, but maybe not long enough. It never ever really seems to be long enough. Megan Maroney is not back. She's still enjoying her vacancy. We will see her on Wednesday, but in her place, we have none other than Ron Richards. How's it going, Ron? Hello. Happy New Year. It's good to be back. I think I ended the year with you, Jason, and now I'm starting the year with you. I love it. I know. And a one-two punch because you're today and then you're also tomorrow. So, hey, I really appreciate it, man, because this is hey, not man, an easy time of year for technology news right before CES. Listen, when you need someone who's passionate about tech and can vamp <laughs> through a slow news day... I'm your man. So That's exactly what I need. That's crazy <laughs> that you just happen to wander in like this. Uh, it's great to have you here. Happy New Year. We've got some tech news to talk about. That's why we're here today. So let's get started. 2017 is fixing to be a big year when it comes to security. So uh, let's kick things off uh, by talking about security research labs. They did some research that shows how easy it is to abuse flight reservation systems. Three systems apparently make up around 90% of all reservations worldwide. And it turns out that those systems have been in use since the 70s and the 80s with modern technology just basically integrated in uh, as opposed to recreating the infrastructure from the ground up, which after that amount of time, you could imagine why that might be necessary. Uh, that in turn has weakened authentication. Uh, the research shows this makes it easy for anyone to capture personal and booking information for anyone using relatively simple methods, things like brute force uh, methods, essentially when you have your baggage tags or whatever you know luggage you have with you, there's a six digit code that's printed on your boarding pass, on your luggage tags, all that stuff. And that gives you, if you have that digit, the, the six digit code that gives you access to all types of your personal information, email, phone numbers, frequent flyer account, credit card numbers, IP address that was used uh, to book. So Obviously, this is a case of, of old technology that apparently needs to be updated badly. Yeah, this is this is something that I've been aware of for about 15 years now, not specifically, at least, you know, the latest information with using the six digit code to access your IP address and stuff like that. But, you know, talk about in our past lives uh, back in 2000, I actually worked on uh, worked for an agency that redid Delta Airlines website. And in doing so, I spent about two months down in Atlanta with Delta Technologies, which is Delta Delta Airlines is, uh, you know, their their IT group, you know, their programmers, all stuff like that. And all of the booking systems, everything was all like in CPM, like totally like, you know, antiquated mainframes and things like that. And as opposed to rebuilding it at the time, we were redoing their website. We needed to write code to access these legacy systems. And, you know, later in my career, I worked in hotels. I worked in the hospitality industry. Same thing, like these yeah. old, old mainframes that are running hotel booking systems. And, you know, these companies are doing what they can to 
upgrade their technology, it's unrealistic to do a complete total from the ground up rewrite of an air, of the airline system because it's just it's too massive of a system. So when that happens, you put on bolt ons, you do things like that to update it, and you end up with holes like this that nobody's nobody's looking at the baggage tag, right? Um, so you know, I'm not surprised to hear about this, and another reason why I try to uh, carry on my bag whenever I can. Yeah, well, I mean, especially when you consider the fact that it's just a tag hanging off your bag. If it, it's probably very easy for someone to just snap a picture yep. of these tags and and they have some information, now, what can they do with that? Well, in some cases, they could actually, you know, re kind of rebook, redirect flights. They could actually pull frequent flyer miles out and add it to a completely different account. I'm just surprised that if this has been this way for so long that we haven't actually heard of those kinds of things happening in great numbers. Well well, because I think we haven't had a big kind of offense happen yet. It just takes yeah. one major hack or something like that to happen. I know my um, not not my airline, uh, but my hotel loyalty program account was hacked once and they took all of my points and transferred them to mm -hmm. Amazon gift cards. Um, uh, luckily, I, I, I caught it as soon as it happened and they caught it. They restored my points, stuff like that. But that's what a lot of hackers are doing is that they're trying to get into those loyalty accounts because you can transfer those points into cash via Amazon gift cards or things like that. Yeah. So or visa, visa gift cards or, you know, so um, it's just another reason to make sure you're, you know, you've got good passwords and all this sort of stuff and hope that articles like this from PC Mag will, you know, uh, enlighten the, the airlines and some of the companies to do something about this. Uh, so we avoid a major hack or a major problem. Yeah. Yeah, um, apparently, like some of some of the recommendations from the report are, you know, if you're not going to just gut this and, and completely start from scratch, which, like you say, that's a, a lot to expect when it's something as critical as like you know airline infrastructure, uh, all, all the interconnectedness between all of these airlines, you know, talking to each other and all that sort of stuff uh, lying underneath. It's not that that believable to think that you could just up you know tear it apart and start from scratch, and there, that would be the easiest thing in the world. But you can kind of batten down the hatches a little bit. Like for example, there is no rate limit on doing search for these six digit numbers. So in in essence, someone could brute force and discover yeah. you know, these things relatively easily because there is no like limit based on an IP address how many times somebody can query a certain, you know, a certain digit, six digit number. Um, yeah. Something like that would at least slow down the process and at least help. Uh, but the long term kind of option, obviously, replace the six digit system. Right. Exactly. And another another reason to do your airline booking in uh, incognito mode or with a VPN uh, <laughs> masking your location because no, that's true. That's true. Good point. You get you get you get access to better rates that way. Uh, if you if you go and they cook at you and you search for a flight and then three hours later you search for it again, the next day you search for it again. Miraculously, the flights went up because they know you searched for it. So and they I always try to do on my, your computer. And yeah, exactly. So, yeah, either. Yeah, yeah, it's right. the cookie that costs you hundreds of dollars. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, Tesla is rolling out the first big update to its enhanced autopilot system, but only to the first thousand cars in its fleet, at least for starters. Anyways, the enhancements include traffic aware cruise control, which adjusts car speed uh, based on vehicles that are directly in front of it. Uh, forward collision warning, which alerts the driver when a collision is expected with a little chime. There's also a red highlight that surrounds the vehicle that you might uh collide with, uh, as well as settings for around how sensitive you want that to be. And then finally, low speed auto steer, which is intended for highway driving at speeds under 35 uh, miles per hour. And throughout this whole process, of course, because Tesla has had a lot of, a lot of, uh, I don't know, misunderstandings, let's say on the, on the side of drivers, as far as how much control these things have, there are many many warnings throughout the details uh, of these kind of upgrades uh, that accompany the update. Yeah, I mean, and this is cool. I mean, this is progress and this is part of their whole plan. I believe, you know, uh, Elon Musk said, you know, all these updates and these changes are going to roll out throughout the year. And the goal is by year's end to have full self-driving capability, which is amazing. I mean, like yeah. a lot of people are really scared of self-driving cars and, and really, you know, kind of are wary of the technology. And there's a lot of reasons to be. But I think Tesla's doing it right by rolling out these pieces slowly to a small group of cars and then eventually to more and more owners get data, be able to respond and react. Um, and this is how progress happens, you know, and so I'm excited to see it develop and hopefully nobody dies.
So <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so apparently, all owners uh, will get this update sometime in the next two or three weeks, at least. They're doing a staged rollout, like I said, a limited to a thousand for starters, and that's just to kind of really control the rollout and to make sure that they've crossed their eyes, <laughs> crossed their eyes, and dotted their t's, um, and and you know by early 2017 they're expecting autopilot to kind of be on parity with the previous functionality that was capable with autopilot one and like you said fully self-driving uh, capable by year's end according to elon musk anyways yeah hey i like that guy he's got good ideas yeah he's, so. he's kind of smart he kind of knows <laughs> what he's doing in, in many ways so uh, bitcoin apparently had a new year's resolution to reach higher than one thousand dollars in value and it did that thanks to a good year that saw it climb 125 percent throughout 2016. It reached $1,022 on the Bitstamp exchange, which is the highest it's been since that Mt. Gox hack, if you remember that, in late 2013. That saw its value plunge from its all-time high of $1,163, $1,163, down to less than $400. How's that for a swing? Um, so yeah, Bitcoin is, is hot again. Maybe I should have one at some point. I don't know. Did I already miss the Bitcoin train or does it matter? What do you think, Ron? It would have been nice to buy it at 400. That's for yeah, sure. Right, but, right. um, uh, yeah, no, I mean the Bitcoin stuff freaks me out. It just freaks me out because it's so, cause it's, it's completely unreg unregulated. It's yeah. completely, you know, it's, it's. I mean, it's it's completely anonymous. The block blockchain technology is amazing, by the way. I have a friend of mine who works uh, not in Bitcoin but in blockchain technology, mm -hmm. and the uh, the things that blockchain can do from a technology standpoint are just fascinating. But the idea of that of it powering a currency like this. I, I personally scares the crap out of me because it's just so virtual and so and to see a, a, a swing between 400 and uh, 1163 is that's that's a very dramatic swing. Um, I'll be curious with the current, you know, the the where the political world is going, what happens to Bitcoin, whether it can stabilize at around a thousand or if we continue to see it climb or drop for what for some reason. Who knows what's going on in China? You know, there's so many variables that's going on with this. Yeah, I mean, the data actually suggests that China is really responsible for much of the trading yeah. that's happening with Bitcoin. The yuan value fell seven percent in 2016. That's the weakest that it's been in over 20 years. And uh, you know, like you say, Bitcoin really isn't regulated uh, by any one authority. It's anonymous. So there's a lot of, of reasons that it's appealing to folks in China, just as one example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just that risk, man, that high swing. Yeah. Although 2016, apparently the biggest daily swing that it had was to only 10%. Um, in 2013, those swings were as high as 40. percent So you know, yeah, I mean, progress. for for it to be taken for it to be taken seriously as a real currency, though, it needs to have it needs to be less yeah, volatile. It needs to have sure. some, you know, you're going to see some percent percent increase and decrease on a daily day, like this, you know, stock markets and trading and all this sort of stuff. But you know, 40 percent in one day in 2013, that's scary. It's nice. It's good to see it kind of stabilizing down to 10 percent last year. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, at the top of many people's New Year's resolutions list, see this, this is an ongoing theme, but it is the day after New Year's <laughs> Day, uh, is likely to strike a better work-life balance. And in France, employment law is helping all of its workers do just that by affording workers the right to disconnect from technology during off hours. Employees with 50 or more workers are now required to work with employees to negotiate ways that they can switch off when they're not at work. Switch off, man. Um, you know, obviously the, the goal here is to kind of reduce burnout on the, on the, in the lives of employees, improve morale, improve their relationships outside of work. Cause obviously when you're working all the time or you feel like you need to be checking in all the time, your relationships outside of work can suffer. I don't know. Sounds, sounds kind of good. What do you think? I, I mean, it, it sounds great from a, on paper. I'm yeah. curious to see how this will work practically. Um, you know, we, I think we, America has helped write the book on overworking our employees especially through especially through devices and email and things like that. Um, I can't help when reading about this and when, when I was reading about this legislation when I went through last year, um, think of Michael Moore's last uh, documentary last year, the, the one where he looked at different countries and how they handle different things and employment was a big part of it. Um, uh, what, what was the name of that movie? I forget what it was. But, um, you know, it's just interesting to see how other companies are handling uh, the, ch the the challenges that are presented by the workplace and what does the 21st century workplace look like, you know, where the government needs to mandate a 50 work week and tell employers that they can't contact employees at night. 
I mean, like that, that when the government gets involved, I get a little worried, but I'm happy to see French workers will be able to relax a little on the weekend and spend some time with their uh, fam for their family. So that's nice. But was it a capitalism, a love story, or whatever? No, it's where to invade next. Where to invade oh, next? That's okay. what it was. Yeah. Okay, I haven't yep. seen that one. Yeah, that one. That one was really, really interesting. I mean, I know and save your comments about Michael Moore, whether you like him or don't like him or whatnot. But it was really, really interesting to see. You know, the, they, they talked to people in Italy about their vacation policy, where right. you know, fo folks in Italy get like twelve weeks of vacation. It's like insane. They get the whole month of August off. They get a bonus thirteenth month of salary to pay for their vacation in August. Like it, it, amazing <laughs> stuff. And then, and then there's a bunch of stuff about employment as well as education and things like that. It just shows how different countries are handling a lot of the modern problems that. Uh, we just keep shoving down our throats in America. So. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, technology yeah. definitely affords a certain flexibility when it comes to your work, but then it also, it, you know, brings with it this like constant yep. connectivity, which at, at least, you know, a lot of people that I know here in the States, you kind of become addicted to that instant access to things. And so yeah. in some ways, you, you end up kind of tricking your mind into thinking, okay, well, this is a worthy trade-off. Like, I want this enough right. to not get rid of the technology, but uh, maybe we need protection from ourselves, and that kind of seems like what this might be all about. I mean, the, the example of this that I always think of is, this is an old story now. This is like nearly 10 years ago, but I remember seeing an interview with a Google developer who was talking about life at Google, and admittedly, again, this is, a you know, about 8 to 10 years ago, so things might have changed. But the example of, you know, he left to go to lunch at noon, and went off campus to go get lunch, came back at one o'clock, and while he was gone, a bug had emerged. A whole bunch of people had emailed and talked about it. Someone had written a fix, and by the time he got back to lunch, it was fixed. And then an uh, hour later, his manager came over and said, how come you didn't help out with that bug? And it, you know, it, so, but I was eating food. Right, exactly. And <laughs> that, that's an example of that's stuff that happens all the yeah. time. And I know a lot of a lot of American workers in this digital workforce, you know, like if you don't respond, somebody else will. And will that person get further ahead than you will? It becomes like this digital rat race thinking that is just maddening. And and so it's uh, I'll be I'll be I want to watch this to see how it's handled in France and how well they work with the companies to regulate it. And right. And what happens if you report it like your boss emails you at nine o'clock, you report it to the government. And then what happens like <laughs> then are you not going to get sanctioned at work like that? So it's it's uh, there's a lot of potential problems with this, but uh, it's neat to see it them try to do it so yeah for for sure yeah. uh coming up your new year's resolution might have been to exercise more but damn that virtual reality is fun wait i know russell holly from vr heads is going to help us discuss how you can combine the two if that sounds like a good idea or not i'm sure we'll get into uh both sides of that story but first let's uh take a minute a uh, minute to thank epson sponsor of this episode epson's revolutionary cartridge-free ecotank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing the ecotank et4550 is a wireless all-in-one printer that doesn't use any cartridges. So what you're used to with all those ink cartridges, you don't have to get used to that anymore. Get used to something else. It features an amazing, innovative, refillable ink tank and actually earned it the title of CES 2016's Innovation Awards honoree. So you're not going to get frustrated with those cartridges anymore. It supplies up to two years of ink that's equal to 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. You can save up to 80% on ink with low cost replacement bottles. It's powered by precision core printing technology. And it's uh, it also has auto two-sided printing and a 30 page auto document feeder. And it's easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones, which is not an easy feat. I've tried it with other printers. It's not always the most straightforward thing in the world here. It's easy. All Ecotank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With Epson's Ecotank line of printers, you'll have the freedom to print without running out of ink. The Epson Ecotank system was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. Visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home, your office, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the Epson Ecotank printers. That's E P S O N dot com slash ecotank and we thank epson for their support of tech news today and the twit network all right working out isn't always fun so we look for ways to take the edge off myself i listen to podcasts go figure but uh what about entering a virtual world to take your mind off the pain joining us is russell holly from vr heads who wrote about this very topic how's it going russell hey how are you going doing good uh happy new year first of all 
Uh, Thank you. Happy New Year. <laughs> uh, so this isn't necessarily what, what you write about in your article isn't necessarily about playing a VR game where you're on a treadmill or maybe it, I, I suppose it could be. Um, this is about playing games that you already play, but kind of adding kind of a different sort of fitness dimension to the experience. Explain what you mean here. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different ways that you can use VR in in kind of fitness workouts, and it's it really kind of all the different kinds of VR that are available. Uh, you know, the, the cool thing about having uh, Gear VR or Daydream or you know one of the portable mobile ones is that you can go kind of anywhere and then have Netflix you know right in front of you when you're running. If your house isn't set up to work like that, or if your gym isn't set up to work like that, then you can pretty easily set that up so that you've got you know kind of VR with you wherever you are. But really, you know, you can take existing games, uh, existing VR games that are very active and add weights to them. Uh, and, and there are even, uh, you know, game systems that are built around uh, workout tools now. There's uh, the the full VR system, you know, where you can climb on an exercise bike and the exercise bike is actually a part of the VR experience that you're in your, you know, on a motorcycle or, or you know, driving a tank. Uh, and, and your movements on the bike dictate what's happening in the game. Yeah, I feel like I've seen that a lot at gyms where you go to a gym and it's got like the bike and then it's got the screen in front of it. And as you're riding the bike, you kind of see this, you know, the game play out essentially where you're kind of moving a character through, you know, to kind of make this more immersive. But I mean, you you throw VR into that context and suddenly it, be, it becomes something much greater than that. It becomes less about exercise, even though you're still doing the exercise, but more about like simulating an experience, which is kind of why you got VR in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a way to kind of complete that immersion, which means you're you're not focused on anything else that's happening around you, and you know, no concerns about distractions. And it, you know, it's maybe not something that you would wind up, you know, wanting to do publicly. But if you're in a place where, you know, if your house is set up in such a way that, you know, your your workout area is, you know, kind of in the basement or in what's basically a broom closet, then you know, VR does a lot to to kind of pull you out of that uh, potentially negative experience and do something better. Yeah, it's a really well, good it's play. like this. This has me thinking of those uh, that zombie run AR kind of oh, audio yeah. based yeah. run, running app where, you know, where for those who don't know, it's it's a running app to help you run. And the idea is you're listening as zombies are chasing you. And the idea is you're running away from the zombies. If you have a treadmill in your basement and you throw on the VR goggles, you can be in the walking dead and then live that <laughs> and also run three miles. Like that sounds like it could be fun. It could make make something that a lot of people dread a little more fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That would be cool. So yeah. are there. um are there VR games that ex exist kind of with the sole purpose of fitness right now? Like I know part part of your article is about taking a game, uh, taking a game that you already have, and you know putting putting strapping these kind of weight bands onto your arms and your legs, and in just playing the game the way you normally would, but now with added weight, it kind of adds an extra layer of, of fitness to the experience. But are there games that are all about uh, exercise right now on these platforms? Yeah, so there there are a couple of games. You know, HTC Vive uh, has uh, two different titles that are focused entirely on uh, you know the the fitness aspect of of moving your body around. There's a kind of like a shadow boxing app where you're you know very deliberately moving around and and uh, you know. Uh, being as active as possible. Uh, and then uh, Oculus Rift has uh, some, they're more kind of uh, aimed at, at uh, wellness exercises. So more like yoga poses and things like that than like, you know, hardcore cardio or anything like that. Uh, but anyone who's played, you know, any amount of, uh, you know, really active games on either of these platforms know that, you know, working up a sweat is really not a challenge uh, for, for a lot of these games. Uh, and that is aided by the fact that VR is uh, easy to sweat in. <laughs> Depending oh, on, yeah. <laughs> on what goggle and everything like that that you're using. I mean, when I was, I, I think I've told this story a couple of times now on this show, but when I first <laughs> checked out the Daydream View uh, at a at a conference last year, when they handed it to me, it was with the disclaimer that the uh, the goggle was damp uh, because when <laughs> oh, you sweat, gross. it, it oh. collects on yep. on the the little squishy part of it. Oh anyway. yeah, Daydream so, in particular because yeah. it's like they're basically sweatpants material. <laughs> I was just gonna the, say the of of all the goggles, Daydream with its heather gray yeah. design and the sweater, the sweatpant material is probably perfect for this, right? <laughs> totally, it was yep. made. With and you get that kind of uh, the the potential for the padding to get wet on basically all of the the headsets. I think PlayStation VR is the only one where like it's a, kind of a rubber padding that doesn't really press up against your face, right? Uh, so it's so it's less likely to do that. Uh, but that's why there are so many uh, there there are several companies right now making a replacement uh, padding 
for like Oculus Rift and HTC Vive and, and those uh, and most of them have, you know, waterproof features where, you know, they're, they're kind of a, a, a rubbery, almost pleather material in, in a lot of cases that stop that uh, that absorption of sweat from happening. And is oh, sorry, Ron, go. I, I was going to say, yeah, no, in, in addition to sweat, I would say also how much of a safety consideration is there where you've got, you know, I, I, I don't use VR a lot, but I do run a lot. <laughs> and so um, and I can't imagine running with goggles on my head like it's additional weight that you've got to counterbalance. Plus, you're you're limiting your vision. So I imagine there's got to be a, a pretty big, you know, not only stay dry, but also be aware of your surroundings at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely would have to be, you know, you would have to really know your environment if you were going to do something like run on a treadmill. Uh, and I think that's why so many of them lean towards things like the exercise bike or, you know, kind of the the yoga pose uh, for, for the building, because it's easier to control that environment, I think, than, than having a moving platform underneath of you. Oh, yeah. man. I mean, on a treadmill, if you've ever been running on a treadmill and your foot just glances oh. to the side of the, you know, where ha half of your foot's on the moving part and half of your foot's on the stationary yeah. part. I mean, that'll knock you right over if you're not ready just, for just, it. So just go, go ahead. To yeah, go to YouTube and type treadmill fail. I'm sure you'll yeah. get a bunch of like shots of people falling on treadmills and uh, now they'll goggles. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, that's why you I, I guess don't riding need on the to bike add is... heavy VR goggles to those falls. Those well, falls are already nasty well, enough. Well, yeah. And I mean, also like another consideration there is that some of these systems are completely wireless. But when you're talking about HTC Vive, you're talking about the Oculus Rift or uh, P you know, PlayStation VR, I mean, they're wired. So that kind of limits your mobility to a certain mm -hmm. degree anyways. It almost seems like this is perfect for something that's like a, a rowing machine or, or a bike or, or whatever, but kind of limited in other ways. Yeah, it's definitely, you're going to, you know, be careful about how you would set it up. But if you yeah. set it up in a way that works for you, then it, it can be really rewarding. I've, I've found myself. Awesome. Um, so that is a, an article uh, at VR Heads, of course. VR Heads uh, has lots of awesome kind of VR content as we, I mean, Exit 2016, which was a big year for VR. Uh, 2017, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more and we'll be following uh, the work that you're doing there. Russell, we really appreciate you coming on and talking about this today. Thanks. This was fun. Absolutely. Um, check out VRheads.com and Russell Holly on Twitter. Thanks again, Russell. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Have a good night. Uh, we got some feedback. William Hugh Murray writes in response to last week's special episode where we looked at security in 2016. We actually heard from a lot of people from that episode. William writes, I had to disagree with Ian on passwords. Uh, your passwords are not being compromised by guessing by brute force or attacks against your system. They are being compromised on the systems of others, most notably eBay and Yahoo, or because you take the bait in a so-called phishing or waterhole attack. Longer passwords do not resist these attacks. They are cheap, ought to be used, but replay is, easy, is as easily done as with short ones. Credential reuse, not secrecy, is the actual problem. The security mechanism of choice, the one that resists replay, is the, quote, one-time password, as implemented by Google, PayPal, Amazon, Dropbox, Twitter, your bank, and yes, your password manager. All of these implement strong authentication, i.e. at least two kinds of evidence, at least one of which uh, resists replay, like a one-time password. And William uh, suggests that writing down all of your passwords, because uh, I think Ian had, had said, you know, probably the, the best way to do this is to write down your passwords uh, long form, you know, like on a piece of paper and store it somewhere safe. Uh, William suggests that writing down all of your passwords is untenable in a world where we have hundreds of accounts and hopefully unique passwords for all of them. And I don't, I have more than hundreds. I have like, yep. well, I mean, I wow. guess it's still hundreds, but it's close to a thousand. I mean, there, there's, once you start using a password manager, you start realizing how many of your passwords are actually out there, how many accounts you have yep. all over the place. And I couldn't even imagine keeping that all written down somewhere. Yeah, no. Uh, once again, thank God for LastPass. I mean, like completely. <laughs> I mean, I I it was I didn't use it until you turned me on to it, and and now I can't live without it. And yeah. I think that combined with I I really believe the the strong authentication, the one time password option, or I've been a I've been a huge proponent of two factor authentication um, on every system. I know Jay said I'm sorry. I know that's a dirty word when it comes. It's we okay. Talk about you. I've gotten yeah. over it. I know you're. Are you over it's it? It's a okay. new year. Yeah. It's a new year. Yeah. Ron. Okay, but but I mean, again, that's you know the idea that. You know, I'm going to get buzzed on my phone if somebody's trying to log into one of my accounts, whether they have my password or not. And unless I type in that that one time password code, um, it's not going to work. And so, like, that's a level of protection that I think is like everyone should have that turned on whatever you can. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think the constant, the, the argument that comes up for something like a password manager, and I believe Ian even raised this point um, last week, was that it's a single password that protects everything. Yeah. Uh, but one thing that William pointed out is like, that's not proven to be a target. You know, I'm kind of wondering like, okay, that hasn't proven to be a target. Yet, is there Yet. a time? Is there a reckoning <laughs> right around the corner where it's like, okay, well, and there we go. Now somebody has every single password in existence for you, for you, a person. Um, I don't know if that's around the corner. Just just speculating that that could even possibly happen. I, William, I really William hope seems you, pretty I, comfortable with it, though. I was gonna say, I really hope you didn't just put that into the into the world by uh, by saying that out loud. So let's I'm <laughs> pretty positive I'm not the only person to have ever yeah, said or true. thought that sort of thing. But uh, <laughs> but yes, I, I use LastPass. I trust it, and uh, it's really it's improved my um, my my password health. Let's say as far yeah. as like how I'm creating passwords and and all that kind of stuff. I feel so much better, but with it. Uh, so definitely check that out. If you're on the fence, it's not that difficult to set up. It takes a little bit of time to set up, but once you have it set up, that's kind of where the magic happens because as you sign into new accounts, it kind of handles it for you and uh, it becomes really easy from there. And it's important to say that, you know, while we're both proponents of LastPass, if you don't want to pay the, the 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 premium for it, you know, there's other options out there. I forget what the one password, stuff like that. There's a bunch of different password managers out there. So you find for the sure. right one that fits for, fits for you. Absolutely. Coming up, the Consumer Electronics Show isn't underway quite yet, although lots of people are on their way out to Vegas. Uh, and that doesn't stop new products from being shown off ahead of time. So we'll talk a little bit about those. But first, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode, and that is Tracker. Uh, we're all used to losing our possessions. Newsweek actually reports the average American wastes 55 minutes a day looking for things that they own, but they can't find them. Uh, Tracker makes losing things a thing of the past. I'm going to tell you how to get one for free. I actually got, we we got a whole bunch. I think we got like 12 trackers. We bought 12 trackers and just gave them out to a bunch of people. It was like a really good stocking stuffer idea. Uh, the Tracker Bravo locates misplaced keys, wallets, luggage, instruments, bicycles, electronic devices, even pets in seconds. It's a coin-sized device. It's constructed with anodized aluminum for the thinnest, most durable tracking. You can... You can really attach it to anything. It's super easy to attach it to things. It has a, a key loop or an adhesive uh, that you can use. Or it's so small you can just like drop it into a little pocket somewhere. Tracker is enabled by Bluetooth LE, so the battery lasts up to one full year. You can add a laser engraved message to each Tracker Bravo. You know, you can put things like return information or, or pet information if it's on your pet's collar. Uh, and you can now personalize your tracker with a custom printed image. If you want to, you know, kind of put your, your company logo on there or whatever you want, really, the sky's the limit. You can have it printed and put on. Pair Tracker to your iOS or Android device and find its precise location uh, with the tap of a button. It's really that easy. Your phone can track up to 10 devices at one time. And you can customize two-way separation alerts so you're notified before you leave your item behind. If you lose your phone, all you have to do is press the button on the tracker and then your phone's going to ring, even if it was left on silent. So you're definitely going to find it uh, at the bottom of the cushions of your couch. With over 3.5 million devices shipped, uh, Tracker has the largest crowd GPS network in the world. Your lost item shows up on a map, even if it's miles away. If you lose your item, uh, the Tracker app records its last known location on a map. And then when another Tracker user comes within a 100-foot range of your item, you will receive a GPS update of where your item is located. Uh, so that's that's the Tracker. It's super easy to use, super helpful. Go to thetracker.com and never lose your possessions again. Plus, just for our audience, if you enter promo code TNT, you'll get a free Tracker Bravo with your order. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R.com, promo code TNT, to get your free Tracker Bravo today. And we thank Tracker for their support of Tech News Today and the Twit Network. So the Consumer Electronics Show it's getting ready to take place. It starts this Thursday, January 5th. And as is usually the case, uh, we're already getting a glimpse into what to expect at the show. Uh, so, you know, we thought we'd take a look at a few things, a few CES products that are hitting the web ahead of the event. Uh, so first up, Dell officially announced the 13-inch Dell XPS 13 
two in one. It's a convertible version of its popular XPS 13 Windows laptop. Uh, it has a slim 5.2 millimeter border around the edges, so it's almost like there's no bezel around most of the edges. <laughs> almost. Because this almost. is a thing now, <laughs> uh, thanks to its Infinity Edge display. That actually also allows for the 13 inch display to fit inside an 11 inch form factor. So if there's one <laughs> nice gain from bezel wow. design, it's that, right? You can fit Let's a larger think, screen and a smaller body. Think about that sentence, a 13 inch display to fit inside an 11 inch form factor. Yeah. We're not talking half an inch, millimeters, we're talking two whole inches. Yeah. How can you not love nearly bezel-less displays when you get two more inches of space? That's I, that's really impressive. Yeah, and no, like bezel-less on, or near, near bezel-less, I don't know, is that a category? Yeah. That's the category now, near bezel-less. Near bezel <laughs> um, On a laptop makes a little more sense to me than on a, a phone. Although, I, I get it, and I know your stance on this, Ron. Uh, this is the future. And this, yep. this is where sci-fi has has been pointing for a long time. So this is where we're headed. But I just feel like on a phone, you're more, you know, there's more reason to have some of those borders there. On a laptop, less so. You're also probably not going to drop your laptop screen down. Knock on wood. Let's hope you don't. Uh, right. But, you know, so it doesn't need it doesn't need to be super resistant to that. Well, way. let's keep let's let's also keep in mind that this is not a laptop. This is a two in one. That's true. Right? That's and so, a good, and point. So, good point. Yeah. So the two, the, so the, so the two and one experience is slightly different than the laptop with the, I'm working on my laptop. Let me open the lid and, and type, 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 you know, whereas you're flipping this around and using it as a tablet. Um, you know, that's when bezel is come, gets that much more interesting when I'm thinking I'm reading a book on the plane with my two and one, as opposed to typing, a you know, typing, a writing a book on my, on the plane. But, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's neat. And I think that, you know, I think that the, the future of laptops is going to be this kind of format. I mean, this is there's no reason not to now with touchscreens becoming that much more accessible and, and priced right. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's neat to see these innovations happening in this product sector. Yeah, for sure. I'm more and more. I'm I'm really happy. Really intrigued by what I'm seeing coming out of these Windows uh, laptops. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's not a sentence that I would have expected to say a couple of years ago, like that I'd actually, yeah. that my interest has peaked so much that I'm like, God, maybe I, maybe I need to check well, this out for myself. And and it's funny though because we we talk a lot on our other, on the show on all about Android every week we talk about the basically the the quiet slow death of the tablet mm -hmm. right the oh, the, sure. the tablet a tablet has not garnered any buzz in what a, two years a year yeah, at really least I mean down. you know and and so if the future of the tablet is these two and ones then cool bring it on because it's more power more processing more uh, functionality and 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 uh, let you do either the tablet or the laptop. Yeah interface you know which is great yeah which is not to say that the tablet doesn't have its time and its place but at least here that's not its sole purpose it, it yeah. has all these other things it has the keyboard and the kind of the laptop format uh for yeah. what that's really good at and then if you need the, the tablet format you have that too this is going to start at 999 dollars. that's 100 dollars more than the regular xps 13 will be shipping uh this month so it's Pretty nice looking. Uh, and actually two versions, full HD and quad HD models. So a cool. little bit of a price difference there as well. Google and Fiat Chrysler announced a project to smash Android Nougat and FCA's Uconnect systems together. This is an Android Auto course, but rather it's built on top of AOSP, Android's open source platform. Uh, this allows FCA to maintain its own UI, its own brand imagery, uh, while showing, uh, still bringing in big features. In their announcement, they say like Google Maps and Google Assistant to, to, I, what? to what I said, huh? Google Assistant <laughs> in the car? Have we heard of this yet? Because I don't think Google Assistant is even in Android Auto. I have not heard Google Assistant and Android Auto at all, and this is really kind of cool. I mean, what? why not? It, it would be perfect. You're driving, you say, I don't want to trigger my Google Home, but you <laughs> you, you trigger Google and, and ask it where, how, how far to the nearest gas station. And you know, like, and if it's plugged into the, the speaker system, that's pretty cool. Oh, and it can keep you uh, company yeah. on long drives. You could sure, tell you, tell you facts about New Year's. Did <laughs> you use that with your Google Home? Did you ask it facts about New Year's? <laughs> no, I didn't. Oh, well, yeah, what I am did, I missing? I, I, 
I wish I wished my Google Home a happy new year. And then it said, happy new year. If you want to know more about new year, I've got some great facts. And so just kept on spitting out facts about new year's. <laughs> it's a so. fact that in the new year, the yeah. calendar changes from 2016 well, to 2017. A little more interesting than oh, that. Okay. That's for sure. Yeah. But, um, but I think this is neat that the, as opposed to implementing Android Auto, which is a very specific product that is directly tied to Google, yeah. they're taking the route of basically – you know, applying their UI on top of AOSP, which is the same same situation as somebody making a, a cell phone that's running Android with yeah. their own flavor of it. Um, you know, an a Amazon Fire Phone or, you know, the, those other kind of variations that happened. Um, interesting workaround. And if it gets assistant in the car, that's something that Android Auto doesn't offer. I know, which is so <laughs> weird to me that, that it would be here yeah. first. Um, as long as you, I, like, I don't know Uconnect. Uconnect is, um, is Fiat Chrysler's, version of their infotainment center that this is being smashed into as long as you connect is good then great but if but if it sucks and they're integrating it in it's kind of like well that was one of the reasons why android auto would exist is because it's yep. a, you know a different let's say different but i would say a, a better take than what you get in a lot of infotainment systems yeah and so now i don't have um you know i don't i don't have a car <laughs> And I don't have, and I haven't used UConnect. Although I might have used UConnect and not even known about it. I mean, right. if 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 Chrysler has been putting this system in their cars for a long time, I gotta believe that the car manufacturers know a little bit of something about the UI of in a car. Mm -hmm. And so as a as Hopefully. opposed to yeah, as opposed to licensing Android Auto, saying okay, take the take the learnings we've learned from the UX of car drivers and apply Android underneath it, so you get those Google services. That's an interesting uh, that's an interesting take on it. Yeah. Yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah. All right. And finally, the second Google Tango phone is apparently nearly upon us, according to a post by Asus hardware partner Qualcomm on its site that temporarily announced the new Zenfone AR before being taken down because it was obviously a mistake. Uh, the phone will be powered by Qualcomm Snapdragon 821 processor, the same processor that we have in the Google Pixel phones. And it will be Google Daydream View uh, VR ready, including support for the Daydream View. I find that particularly intriguing because anytime I've ever seen or played around with Tango, and especially in light of Daydream's announcement and launch, I've thought the two were meant for each other. And, th and I hope, and I hope that we'll see that this isn't just they exist on the same device and can be used separately, but that there will be some sort of uh, collaboration between the two because then you've got inside out tracking and that's awesome. That, exactly. Took the words right out of my mouth. That, that, that's, that's the, the magic. That and I'm surprised, I'm surprised that we hadn't seen this before and I haven't heard very much rumblings about that sort of thing. But I mean, t Project right. Tango, basic, the technology of Project Tango is cool. When I played around with it, if I felt like it was kind of lacking, like it was, yeah, that's neat that you can do that, but why would I get this particular phone to do that? This, in my opinion, gives it a purpose that is very in tune with right now, with, with VR becoming, you know, more and more of a curiosity for people. Yeah, up to up to now, I think the the only real killer app for Tango that we've seen has been the Home Depot use case, which is right. you know using using a Tango device to you know to assess a room and know the the measurements and know what the physical room likes and then apply different designs and things like that. But you apply that to Daydream and VR, and that then then you become an immersive experience, kind of you know kind of physical and virtual kind of world, which is which I think is is kind of what the goal is, right? So yeah. And if we get to a point where Tango is just another technology that's included with these phones and you don't have to have like that Lenovo Fab 2 Pro or Fab Pro 2, I can never remember the order of those words, uh, yeah. was gigantic. And I mean, it sounded large on paper. And then when I saw it in real in real life, I was like, whoa, yeah, that's that's too big. Um, like I, I would that is a utility phone that is not necessarily yeah. an everyday phone that also has this new thing that you can do with it. Um, so hopefully they, they're able to kind of shrink that down and into devices like this and it becomes just another feature in an everyday phone. Yeah. Best case scenario. Uh, starting Wednesday, we're going to be bringing, uh, well, we'll begin to get some actual coverage from the event. Father Robert Balasser, of course, is there doing coverage for Twitch and, uh, he's going to be in Vegas for the fun. So he's going to be sending back some, uh, some of the stuff that he's finding, uh, starting Wednesday. So we'll make sure that you see that when that happens. TNT's Fan of the Day is Herb Ballou. He is actually a regular contributor uh, to Fan of the Day. We've had him uh, on a couple of times throughout 2016. Shared this picture on Twitter saying he's catching up on my TNT and pretty much the best place 
rocks near Ku is it Kugi or Kuji Beach, uh, Australia. Whatever, whatever it is on how you say that, that looks nice, and I want to be there. Uh, and, and nice, <laughs> nice blue shoes. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a new year, and we need a fresh crop of these. Okay, so please. Take a picture of your setup. Do it right now. You know, you're just there. You've got a phone. You might as well take a picture of where you are right now, where you're listening, you're watching, whatever the case may be. What do you have to lose? Uh, you can post it to Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag how I watch TNT, and we are going to find it. Up next, what is New York without cabs everywhere you look? I'm sure Ron has some opinions on that, but first. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Uh, I knew it. I knew you would. I knew this was perfect for you. But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of today's episode. That is Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Uh, Rocket Mortgage, I mean, if you've ever gone through the mortgage process, we went through it a, a few years ago. It's got a lot of, uh, well, let's say a lot of road roadblocks, a lot of speed bumps along the way. You've got to pick out, you know, find this piece of information. You've got to dig up this paperwork. This, that, I mean, it's all over the place. The, the information that they need in order to, you know, let you apply for this, the mortgage, it takes a lot of hunting, a lot of searching, and hopefully you have that information easily available. Otherwise, um, you're going to have a bad day. So Rocket Mortgage is all about making that easier for you. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone uh, that you can trust, who has your best interest in mind. And with Rocket Mortgage, you're going to get a transparent online process it gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. And because it's online, it also makes it a whole lot easier. They've built in all these ways that can help you pull in that information that you need to pull in. You don't have to waste time searching through your stacks of old you know, files and paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely share your financial info uh, to get a mortgage approval in minutes. So you're going to know right away. You're not going to have to wait around for a couple of days and wait for that uh, email to come in. You're going to know within minutes. You can even adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to kind of play around with the numbers to make sure that you get the mortgage solution that's just right for your financial situation. Whether you're looking to buy a home or even to refinance your existing mortgage, uh, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. It's going to make it easier for you to do that and uh, give you the tools you need to really kind of uh, get in there and, and get a sense of of what the uh, what the reality is. Skip the bank. Skip the waiting. Go completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans uh, for their support of Tech News Today and the Twit Network. New York City is riddled with taxis, somewhere around 13,000. <laughs> And apparently they could all be replaced by a puny 3,000 ride-sharing vehicles. Uh, <laughs> this is the result of research by MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Uh, the research shows a significant reduction in traffic congestion and, of course, fuel use and pollution. They, can, they kind of devised a system here uh, and, and played it out in this example, this research. MIT says that a smaller fleet would meet around 98% of the city's needs with an average wait time of 2.7 minutes. I have to imagine that's a, a pretty good wait time, or I don't know. I, I guess I'm not from New York, so actually when uh, I think about it, you just kind of walk out there and you raise your hand and suddenly there's a exactly. taxi. That's what movies tell me anyways. And for the most part, for the majority of the city, especially Manhattan, that's that's the, that's the case. And actually, they've actually even improved the outer boroughs with the with the newer green. They have green cabs now for the outer boroughs that are a lot easier to get. Um, this is really cool, and I, I I dove into this when I saw it in the rundown. Um, I think that it's amazing what MIT's computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory can come up with in a laboratory in a controlled environment <laughs> setting. Um, I think they're not taking a lot of things into account, such as sometimes you don't want to share a ride. Uh, you know, sometimes you, sometimes you want, you know, sometimes you've got a group of, you know, two or three people and you want a car to yourself or whatever. Um, there's a lot of human factors to ride sharing that I think are, um, that aren't taken into account here. Additionally, 
And of course, this whole this whole program doesn't take into account the decades old legacy economy that is, exists from the taxi medallion system, which is never going away. You talk about like one of the strongest unions or like, I don't know if it's a union, but kind of business organizations. But like the, the value of a taxi medallion is even though it's much less than it used to be, it's still like in the hundreds of thousands, which is just crazy. The whole taxi business is a crazy racket. Um, but I mean, the the it's hard to argue the smaller fleet, the 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 traffic congestion problem, and the fuel use and pollution. Those are all all really neat. I gotta think that there's somewhere between what we have now and what this model is offering, where they're gonna meet in the middle. Because essentially, all ride sharing is is harkens back to the 1940s with streetcars. You know, it's the same concept that you want to get from point A to point B. So there's a vehicle going in that direction that you're going to hop into for a short period of time. Yeah. Um, of course, streetcars are immensely complicated with track systems and all stuff like that. Um, but you know, th there's something to be said about consolidating the all the people driving around the city low, the way they are. That said, three minutes to wait for a cab. I'm I'm that's too long. <laughs> see up here in petaluma i'm like up yeah. here in petaluma i'm like yes yeah, yeah. that sounds all right well uh, it's it's, it's funny water. because, but, because you know, new york's a different beast entirely well coming you know coming from san francisco to new york you know where you know the cab the cab uh, industry is just decimated in san francisco because of uber and lyft and things like that um coming to new york i never used uber or lyft because you could always just get a cab Right. right, it's not a right. problem. Um, but the cost savings, of course, and actually in New York, there's a there's a new startup called Juno, um, which is a New York based startup that's giving Uber a run for its money, cheaper rides, basically the same thing when Lyft came out. You know, like they're offering, you know, it's like half the price of Uber or whatever. So it becomes a cost saving thing. But I'm standing on the street in Manhattan. I see it's five minutes till my Uber comes. I go, forget this. I can get a cab in two seconds. You know, so um, yeah. it, it's really interesting to see how the transportation business model, how New York is so unique because of its small, you know, small surface area, which is so many cars that are covered by it. Um, even though, you know, Uber and, and Lyft are surging uh, in the city, it's mainly in those outer boroughs and for people who want to save money and not pay the full taxi fare. Right, right. Yeah. Now, um, I have to imagine, you know, ride sharing companies like Uber and Lyft are already working on what MIT uh, yeah. kind of came up with here. They say critical to their approach here. It's based on four person vehicles. So like you said, it would almost force sharing uh, with other people uh, is dynamic repositioning of the fleet in real time. Uh, they say that makes it 20% faster. So that's like algorithmic changes based on where the fleet is at any given time. And then a new kind of destination, a new, a new pickup emerges, how all of those cars just automatically at the spur of the moment kind of change what their initial plan was in order yep. to kind of reroute to make everything even more efficient as as it goes along. And uh, yeah. that's an interesting well, approach. And I, I'm sure the all the ride sharing companies that are working on self-driving vehicles and stuff are working on just this as well. Yeah, and I have, I have a, a practical uh, example of this, which is recently I was here, in, you know, I, so I, I'm in New York City, I'm in, I'm in a part of Queens, and I needed to get to the Home Depot, which was uh, nearby, I mean, not that far, um, from where I am, maybe maybe a five to seven minute drive. Um, and I called an Uber and I did Uber pool because it was four bucks, right? And it took me about 35 minutes to get there because they kept on rerouting the driver to pick people up along the way. Uh -huh. And we went all the way away and then all the way back or whatever. So like there's still a lot of science that's got to be solved for this yeah. in order to make it truly optimized. Uh, but it's really interesting and, and much like the Tesla self-driving that we talked about earlier in the show, um, you know, just to see the, the advancements and the innovations that are coming in transportation in the upcoming years is going to be really exciting. Oof, yeah, it's going to be a doozy. We got a lot to look yep. forward to. Uh, Ron Richards, always awesome getting to hang out with you because yeah. you're my friend first and foremost, but also because I love podcasting with you. Tell people uh, what you're working on. You got other shows going on right now. Sure thing. Yes. Excited for the New Year's. Uh, this is a packed week of podcasting. I'm excited to get back at it now that the holidays are <laughs> over. Uh, but yeah, so I'm going to be back here on TNT tomorrow. Right, Jason? Yep, we're going to yep. be doing it. Yep. So we're going to be do I'm going to be a twofer tomorrow. So right after that is all about Android at, at 530 Pacific time on the Twit Network. Talk Talking about everything Android, love it. Um, also check out iFanboy over at iFanboy.com where me and uh, my two buddies 
are talking about comic books every week. We also talk about movies and TV shows and things like that. So if you're into comic book themed geekery, I fanboys where you want to go. Um, and then of course my latest podcast is uh, called the Damn Fine Podcast, and you can find that at damnfinepodcast.com. Where me and our mutual friend Tom Merritt yep. is uh, we're revisiting and reanalyzing the, the TV show Twin Peaks in anticipation of the upcoming season three that's coming later this year. We're very excited. We're having a blast. We're uh, about to wrap up uh, season one. In fact, Sarah Lane is our guest next week oh, nice. uh, on the show. So, yeah, so so we do the big season one finale with Sarah next week. Um, that comes out every Wednesday, um, and you can subscribe at damnfinepodcast.com. If it weren't already in the can, I'm assuming that it probably yeah. is. I'd say yeah. say hi to Sarah for me. But yeah, we know. we, we recorded. We, we we were on the holiday <laughs> schedule. We finished about two weeks before Christmas, yeah, so we didn't exactly. have to worry about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> leaving the so. room, uh, Ron. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. All right, yep. have a good night. Uh, real quick, we heard from many people who wanted twi a Twit store, and here it is. The new Twit store is now open. You can check out new designs. Uh, we also brought back some popular favorites, so a lot of these designs over the course of the last couple of years that you liked but that you missed the opportunity to get them, well, now you can. Uh, some of those are being added in. And then we will be adding show-specific gear as well as new, new designs uh, every week. So all you got to do to check this out, go to twit.tv slash store, and you can check out the designs, see the clothes, and uh, make sure and check back regularly because your favorite show whatever it may be, <clears throat> might end up having some clothes for you to wear with it on it. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, and find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today uh, TV. You can always find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, you can. I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Ron is uh, at RonXO, by the way. So, uh, oh, I yes, I didn't even mention that. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. <laughs> Ron's still here. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Hi again, Ron. Uh, thanks to our technical director, Brian. Uh, it's good to have you back there, Brian. Thanks to Bert for helping out here in the studio. Thanks to Kevin for editing the show. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Bam. Yeah. <laughs>